The Peter Schiff Show. Well, it's Good Friday today. The markets are closed, but I finally have some free time to record this podcast. I know there are some people that were wondering why I didn't do a podcast on Wednesday, you know, the day that we had this big drop in the price of gold. People were thinking, aha, you know, Peter Schiff, he, so he's afraid to do a podcast when the price of gold is down. Believe me, I love doing podcasts if the price of gold is down because I know a lot of the people who are interested in gold want to know what my thoughts are on a day that it happens to go down. Now, as it turns out, I did have a interview on CNBC Fast Money where I I was in the city that day, and so I was able to stop by the studio. So you were able to see me react to it a little bit if you saw me on CNBC or if you watched the the video of my CNBC appearance that I posted on my YouTube channel. But I would have loved to have done a full podcast, but I've been busy up until today, and so I am now going to record it as well as comment on some of the other information uh, that came out, some of the economic data that came out Thursday. And even today, we got some data. Even though the markets are closed, uh, some government bureaucrats were releasing some economic numbers on corporate profits and GDP revisions for the fourth quarter. So I will get to that later in this podcast. But first, let me talk about that big drop in the price of gold on Wednesday that I wasn't able to address until now. And gold was down, was it about 30 bucks, I think, uh, on that day? And it actually ended up following through with uh, some decline yesterday, another couple of bucks. Silver was down uh, quite a bit as well. I think maybe 50 or 60 cents. Snapped back a few pennies yesterday, but a big drop Still, of course, gold is holding above uh, 1200 and gold is still positive on the year. Not so for the U.S. stock market, which I believe this week now slipped back into negative territory. Also, not only was gold weaker on Wednesday, but the dollar was considerably stronger. And commodities in general, like crude oil, copper, also went down. So what was the catalyst? Now, it's possible with when it comes to gold, you might say maybe it's because gold failed to really rally on the terrorist attack that we had the day prior in uh, in Belgium. Because sometimes, you know, everybody expects, oh, gold's going to go up on any kind of geopolitical uh, event that happens. And so here there's a terrorist attack and the knee jerk reaction was people bought gold. But since that rally wasn't that big and not really sustainable, maybe people thought, hey, wait a minute, this was good news for gold and gold didn't rally on that good news. And when a market doesn't rally on good news, it generally means that it's overbought or it's ready to go down. And so people might have jumped on the failure of gold to sustain a big rally on what was believed to be good news as bad news. So that might be one of the reasons that you had the selling. Now, to me, it's a non-event. I mean, I don't buy gold because I'm worried about a terrorist attack. It's got nothing to do with the reason that I buy gold. And I wouldn't rush to buy gold just because there was a terrorist attack. Why would I? Because then the attack is over. What, the price goes right back down? So it doesn't make any sense. The real reason to buy gold has to do with inflation and the central banks creating it, artificially low interest rates, negative interest rates, quantitative easing, all of these things. And this this doesn't have anything to do with terrorism and to the event that terrorist activity leads to more government spending, theoretically, to keep us safe. Yes, over time, that is bullish for gold because more government spending that's not financed by taxation, which is generally the way it's done, means more money printing, right? More inflation, bigger deficits. So in the long run, this stuff is good for gold. But in the short run, it's just a bunch of noise. But traders uh, can certainly jump on some of these as a reason to buy or sell and then read things into it or the lack of movement and assume that there's some fundamental reason to what's happening when there's not. But I think the more significant factor that hurt gold were comments by several Federal Reserve officials to the extent that April is now a live meeting, live from the perspective that they still might raise interest rates. Now, these comments are coming less than two weeks after the official March meeting where the Fed could have raised interest rates, but didn't. But not only didn't they raise interest rates, they went out of their way to diminish the expectations of future rate hikes so that after the Fed's March meeting, people who thought the Fed was going to raise rates 
you know, four times or three more times during the year, thought, well, at most two, but a lot of people started to say, well, they're not going to raise them at all, right? They, it was a very, very dovish uh, press conference following the official release of their statement. So now, just what, a week later, you've got some of the same guys on the FOMC now saying, oh, we might raise rates in April. Well, what do you mean? If you're thinking about raising rates in April, why were you so dovish last week? And if you're going to raise them in April, why don't you just raise them in March? Right. I mean, none of this makes any sense, especially if you look at the economic data and some of it I'm going to get to in a minute. But I've already gotten to other economic data that has come out since the Fed decided not to raise rates in March. And in general, it's been weaker uh, than was expected. So if the Fed has been given weaker economic news than what they were expecting when they didn't raise rates, why would they now be raising the specter of a rate hike coming up next month? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, is this some kind of trial balloon? Is the Fed just trying to gauge what the market's reaction would be if they were to raise rates in April? I mean, I don't know why they need a trial balloon because it's obvious how the markets are going to react. But, you know, I think the Fed is losing even more credibility. It's hard to believe they have any credibility left to lose when they're so schizophrenic. They're raise rates. They're not going to raise rates. They're going to raise rates. I mean, and they know that the markets are going to react to everything they say because the markets are just so preoccupied with these central bankers, right? We have a, we have a market of men and a very few men, not of, of fundamentals or valuations or reality, but everything teeters on the words that come out of the mouths of a few key bankers who don't know anything about real economics, maybe, and who are extremely biased and have an agenda. Yet, for some reason, what they say means so much. But they know that, yet they came out and talked about this. Now, again, I think it's more bluff. I think it's more of the same kind of strategy they had all last year. Talk about raising rates. Talk about raising rates. Talk about how strong the economy is and how it's strong enough to withstand rate hikes. But then you don't actually deliver the rate hikes that you're hinting about. Because remember, the Fed talked about raising rates for all of 2015, and it wasn't until there was two weeks left of the year that they finally raised them. And they raised them by the least that they possibly could, a quarter point. I mean, technically, could they have gone 10 basis points? I suppose, but people would have been nervous. They would have said, what's the Fed afraid of? You know, why aren't they doing the full quarter point, right? So they raised by the littlest amount that they could and get away with it by claiming they they still raised. And then they quickly uh, reduced our expectations for rate hikes from four down to two. And and then they're, now they're coming up again. This is the same thing, the same game, open mouth operations that we got last year. But let's look at some of the economic data that has come out since I, my last podcast. We got the durable goods numbers for February. And the durable goods numbers came out weaker than expected but here is the, the real weakness, because last month in January, there was a bounce in durable goods, and that got people optimistic. So those numbers were revised lower. So the original bounce for January for durable goods was 4.9. That was reduced to a bounce of just 4.2. Now, the consensus was for a 3% decline this time but for a 3% decline from up 4.9. So we actually got a 2.8% decline, but it was from a smaller increase. So the net is that the number in February is below consensus. And the fact is it was still a decline. And X transportations, it was even a, a bigger number. If you last month, we got up 1.8. And that increase of 1.8, was revised down to just an increase of 1.2. That's a significant difference. This month, the consensus was for a decline of 0.2. Instead, we got a decline of 1%, which almost completely wiped out the previous advance. See, they were looking for a slight decline of up 1.8, right? A 0.2% decline of up 1.8. Instead, we got a full 1% decline from a a revised number that was only 1.2% Advanced. So this durable good number was very, very weak. And it also questioned anybody who thought that last month's number was some significant improvement. In fact, it was a dead cat bounce. And if you look at the fact that these durable good numbers were down, this is the 13th consecutive month where durable goods, X transportations, have declined on a year over year basis. 
That is the longest losing streak for durable goods in the 70-year history of this report uh, when we were not in a recession. So the only time that you've seen a string of year-over-year declines that were this long in the last 70 years, the only time that's happened is when the economy was in a recession. So again, either this is just an extreme aberration and something weird is going on that doesn't normally go on, or we're actually in a recession and we just haven't admitted it yet. Now, also, we got some information yesterday, the PMI Services Index, which last month in February was actually below 50. It was 49.8. And people were looking for a big bounce. I'm not exactly sure how high, but we got a bounce, but we only got back to 51. So even that PMI Flash Services Index was very muted because 51 is barely any expansion at all. And Kansas City Fed Manufacturing, we had another negative number in March. It was down 12 in February, down another six in March. So this number continues uh, to print negative number after negative number. So all the economic data that came out yesterday was weak. In fact, it was so weak that the Atlanta Fed reduced their estimate for first quarter GDP all the way down to 1.4%. Now, if you remember on this podcast, I talked about it about a month ago, that the Atlanta Fed was so excited about some of the news that had supposedly come out that they ratcheted up their estimate, which initially began at under 1% when they first put it out. And they had ratcheted all the way up to 2.7%. And there was all kinds of fanfare. I was reading about this all over the internet. Look at the Atlanta Fed. Look at their estimates, right? There was lots of news coverage as they were ratcheting it up. Very little news coverage yesterday when it came all the way back down to 1.4. Remember, I, I said I thought that maybe some of the other Fed officials had, you know, read the Riot Act over to the Atlanta guys and say, hey, don't you guys understand what we're doing? Get, 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 get Join the team. You know, we're all positive. We're talking about how great things are going to be. Right? You guys got to get with the program. Get your minds right. Get optimistic. And, and they did. But I said at that time that I believe that as the data continued to come out negative, that the Atlanta Fed would have to start walking down that estimate. And now they've walked it all the way down to 1.4%. So the estimate from the Atlanta Fed, and of course, there are a lot of other uh, Wall Street firms that have their own economists. Well, I don't know. They waste their money on those guys, but they employ them nonetheless. And they're all moving down their estimates. And they're all lower than they were uh, a week ago, week and a half ago, when the Federal Reserve came out and said, hey, the economy is too weak to raise rates now, but you know we, we might do it in the future. They didn't actually say too weak. They just didn't raise rates. The implication being they didn't think it was strong enough. Otherwise, they would have because the inflation numbers were getting higher. Right. Core core inflation is 2.3. So that's checked off. Uh, unemployment is 4.9 percent. They got to check there. So why aren't they raising rates? They must be worried that the economy isn't strong enough to sustain the higher rates or clearly they would have raised them. Well, if they were worried and didn't raise rates in March when expectations for first quarter GDP were higher, higher than they are today, then now that we've got these revisions, why is everybody so convinced that the Fed's about to pull the trigger in April? I don't know. It's kind of Pavlovian dog. I mean, everybody still looks at these guys and believes what they say. Well, you know, again, it's like the little boy crying wolf. How many times can the Fed pretend they're about to raise rates and not do it? Now, they did do it once, so that kind of keeps people guessing. Oh, they did it in February. I mean, they did it in December. So maybe they'll do it again. Maybe that's probably one of the reasons they didn't do it, to keep everybody guessing, to keep everybody on their toes that they that they might actually do it again. Now, we actually got earlier today, despite the fact that the markets are closed in observance of uh, the holiday, we did get the release of the final revision for the fourth quarter GDP. And if you remember, it was originally reported at 0.7. And then they revised it last month to up one. And it was expected to stay at up one. But instead, it was revised upward again to plus 1.4. Now, supposedly this is going to show 
that the economy was stronger than people thought, right? It didn't slow down as much. You know, I've been saying maybe the economy slipped into recession at some point in the fourth quarter. It doesn't mean it had to be in the recession for the entire quarter. It might have slipped in the recession in December or something like that. But clearly people are going to say, oh, you see, Peter Schiff is wrong, right? The economy grew 1.4%. Well, again, they might revise that number way down six months or a year from now and put it into negative territory. And of course, they're still assuming that the inflation rate was 0.9, right? They're still assuming year-over-year inflation was less than 1%. I don't buy that. I think inflation was quite a bit higher than that. And so I think the growth is being manufactured by the statisticians, not by the economy. But be that as it may, I still think that when all the dust settles, they might end up uh, ratcheting that number down negative. But ironically, because that number was higher than estimated, That's probably going to cause people who thought, like the Atlanta Fed, that the first quarter was going to be 1.4. They're probably going to take that down. Because if you look at why the number was 1.4, it was because of extra spending by consumers on services. And potentially some of the services that they spent money on, maybe they spent that money in December and now they're not going to spend it in January. Maybe they front loaded Uh, some of that consumer spending. And so what we gained in the fourth quarter of last year, we are going to give back in the first quarter of this year because all that consumption spending isn't very healthy because we know the consumer is in bad shape. He doesn't have a good job. He doesn't have any savings. So to the extent that he's spending more money, it's borrowed money and none of that is good. Also, what's the most disturbing is if you look at the breakdown of the growth in consumer spending for the quarter, by far, by far, the biggest increase in consumer spending was for health care. And of course, included in that health care spending is the Obamacare tax, right, which is for health care. And if you look at the growth in health care and compare it to the growth of the next highest sector, which is recreational goods and vehicles, it's almost twice, right? We had about a, you know, 42, $43 billion increase in that category, whereas we had about an $85 billion increase in healthcare. So twice as much as the next highest growth factor. Now, this is not a good thing. The fact that we're spending more money on healthcare, that is a bad thing. See, nobody wants to spend more money on healthcare. You want to spend less money on healthcare. You know, the idea amount to spend on healthcare is zero. That means you didn't get sick, right? You know, you were completely healthy and you didn't need to spend any money. I mean, does anybody think it's good news when they have to go to the doctor and pay a bill? No, right? You know, you want healthcare spending as a percentage of your economy to be as little as possible. What you want is good health. You want to spend as little as possible on that health. So you have more money to buy stuff like recreational goods and vehicles, right? That's what people want. You don't want more doctor's bills. You'd rather have more bills because you did things that you enjoyed doing, right? Either you bought products that gave you um, a utility, that gave you enjoyment, or you engaged in activities that you liked, right? You don't go to the doctor for fun, right? You, You want to stay healthy so that you can do all the other things that are fun. So the less you spend on healthcare, the better. The fact that healthcare expenditures are rising so rapidly, this is a terrible thing. I mean, pretty soon, healthcare may be the most expensive thing that we buy or the biggest part of our budget. It starts crowding out everything. If the government makes health care so expensive, you have no money left over for everything else, right? And what the same thing with all the job growth. All the jobs are in health care or a lot of the jobs are going in health care. This is not a good thing. We don't want all these people working in health care. We want them doing things more productive. Yes, we want to be healthy, but we don't want to spend all our money on our health care. We want to be so healthy that we can spend a lot less money on health care. So this is a negative development. The fact that we, the biggest increase in spending is on health care and the fact that more and more of our money that we earn is going to be required to be spent on overpriced health care. Now, if we hadn't had this big jump in health care spending, what would the GDP have been, right? Maybe it would have been lower. Maybe people would have decided not to spend that money. Maybe they would have saved it. It would have been good for the economy, or certainly they could have spent it on something else. But the fact that we had 
this big increase in spending, and everybody is going to say this is great because it shows that the economy is stronger. Remember what we spent the money on and that it's not indicative of strength, but an underlying weakness. Meanwhile, if you want to look at the other piece of news that came out today, it was corporate profits, or rather the lack of corporate profits, because they plunged. They were down on a quarter by 3.6%. I think the the biggest statistic that I read in there about corporate profits was the 15% year over year after tax decline in corporate profits. That's huge. But this was the biggest, I think, decline uh, in corporate profits since 2008. And during the depth of the Great Recession, right, the worst economic period since the Great Depression, and that's the only time that you had corporate profits fall like this, or you have to go all the way back to that period before you find a point in time where profits drop by more than this, right? So if corporate profits are plunging, particularly in the fourth quarter of last year, what does that tell you about capital spending or employment in 2016? Because corporations are losing their profits or some corporations have losses, right? And others have smaller profits. What does that mean? Less CapEx spending. What does that mean? That hurts the GDP. That hurts employment in those areas. Because if I'm making capital investments, generally there's going to be labor utilized uh, as a result of those investments. If I don't make the investments, the jobs aren't there either. Also, if corporations are hurting, if their profits are down, they've got to cut their expenses. What are their expenses? Their workers, right? So layoffs are coming. Obviously, the growth came... Despite falling corporate profits, it was all based on consumer spending. Well, if a lot of these consumers end up getting laid off because their employer had no profits, how much money are these consumers, these unemployed consumers, going to be spending in the future? So the economic news that has been released since the Fed's decision not to raise rates has only gotten worse. And the forecasts have been ratcheted down. So I think that this was a scare, right? This was a bluff, trial balloon, whatever you want, and that the markets overreacted to a couple of Fed officials coming out and talking about how April's a live meeting. Yeah, I mean, March was a live meeting too. All the meetings are live. But in any event, the rate hikes are likely dead, right? Just because they, in theory, can raise interest rates, in reality, they probably won't. And of course, the closer we get to the election the less likely they are. And, you know, now I'm reading more articles uh, about, you know, Donald Trump and how Janet Yellen doesn't want to be the one responsible for putting Trump in the White House. And I've been saying this all along, right? The the stronger Donald Trump is in the polls, uh, the more Janet Yellen wants to make sure that he doesn't win if he's the nominee. And if she raises rates, if the Fed raises rates, and that puts even more downward pressure on a weakening economy and puts more pressure on the stock market, that simply elevates the chances of uh, Donald Trump surfing into the White House on that wave of voter discontent. So if she wants to try to prop things up long enough to, to deny him the White House and, and put Hillary in that spot and secure her renomination, she's got to keep this house of cards from falling apart. And that means she's got to keep interest rates down. She can't raise them. The only problem, right, the fine line she's trying to walk is how do I not raise interest rates yet not invalidate the recovery? Because President Obama wants to pretend that we have a real recovery and that everybody who says no is peddling fiction. Well, how can the Federal Reserve peddle the same fiction, right? The Federal Reserve can't say the economy is too weak to raise rates, Uh, because they don't want to undermine that narrative, because that is what Hillary is running on. Hillary is running on the success and the achievements of Obama and promising to continue that, you know, four more years, which is a tough thing to run on when those have been four lousy years. In fact, they've been eight lousy years. The only way to pretend they're not is to maintain the fiction that the recovery is here. And this is a real economic recovery. We've got all these jobs and, you know, we fixed all the problems that the Republicans created. And so now you don't want to go back to to that. You don't want to make that mistake uh, and and go back to the party that wrecked the economy. You want to vote in the party that saved the economy. So that's the line that the Fed has to walk, right? How do I pretend the economy is great, but then not raise rates, right? Because not raising rates is an admission the economy is not great. And again, I still think that the Fed is going to try to pretend the economy is great, 
but not raise rates, to have its cake and eat it too. And to the extent that they're not doing it, they could blame it on uh, events overseas or other things that somehow take the pressure off the Obama administration and put it on other external factors. And ultimately, I think the way the Fed has to deal with core inflation being above their target, and I think they're going to continue to rationalize this as trying to say that, well, you know, some of these price increases are transitory and, you know, we're looking at an average. And yes, we want to make sure that inflation on average, right, is 2%. And since we had so many years below 2%, To have a few years above 2% is no problem because it still brings that average down. And when she starts talking about that officially, that is going to really undermine the dollar because it'll let people know how out of control inflation could ultimately get if the Fed is going to play this game. And so this big decline that we saw in gold right, could end up being a great buying opportunity and the rally in the dollar that you know, that we experienced just another sucker's rally. And I think that this renewed bear market in the dollar is still underway. And this new upward leg, this new bull market leg in the gold market is uh, is here to stay and is a buying opportunity, not a reason to panic. Attention listeners, I have an urgent message for you. We're in the middle of a war. The global conflict is destroying the lives of millions without a single bomb being dropped. It's called the International Currency War, and your bank account has been drafted to fight. The victims in this conflict are our currencies, the dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound. They're all heading to zero as irresponsible central banks compete to see who can print the most the fastest. But there's one form of money politicians and central banks can't destroy, gold. Today, it's more important than ever to understand the value of gold in your portfolio and to keep a close eye on major market developments. Subscribe to my monthly video cast and you'll be the first to hear my latest analysis on gold investing and the currency wars. Visit goldvideocast.com right now to subscribe for free. I call the dot-com bust, then the housing bust, and I advise clients to diversify into foreign equities and hard assets while the rest of Wall Street laughed at me. Now I want to keep you up to date on the next crisis that is brewing. My gold video cast also includes personal interviews I've conducted with other contrarian investors like Jim Rickards and Axel Merck. Gold has gone up 256% since 2003, but it has a lot further to go. Don't miss the rally. You can prosper during this time of currency wars, but only if you stay educated. Get a free subscription to my gold video cast at goldvideocast.com. That's goldvideocast.com. There's so much factually incorrect information and underreporting by legacy media today. Shouldn't there be truth in media? Well, there is truth in media. Recently, a novel thought is now a reality with truthinmedia.com. Led by award winning journalist Ben Swan, truthinmedia.com is the source for uninfluenced, reliable, fearless news where journalists pursue real questions, not conspiracies. Make truthinmedia.com your default browser's homepage today and get breaking news and commentary that speaks the truth to power. It's also where you can tune into The Peter Schiff Show every week. Visit truthinmedia.com today. That's truthinmedia.com. Access the Truth in Media RS feed by visiting truthinmedia.com forward slash feed.